sorry, 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27. Saul has just returned to his place. David has gone on his way. And we see that David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahonam of the Jezreelites, and Abigail the Carmelites, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. And David said to Achish, If now I have found favor in your eyes, I let me then give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish dw- gave him Ziglag, which is uh, that day, sorry. I'm getting myself lost with my eyes. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Gershalites, the Gezerites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old, as you go up to go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away sheep and the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremelites, and against the southern region of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us. Saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Amen. The Lord give us understanding of him. Let's turn to that chapter, 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27. You'll not have any pictures if I don't press a button. There we are. God at a distance. God at a distance. Of course, that's in part not true, is it? God cannot be removed. He is thoroughly acquainted with everything. But there are times in our lives where we may feel that we are distancing God from us, or something has happened that we are keeping him at arm's length, or we don't feel that he is as close. This appears to be where David is at part in this passage. As we find in 1 Samuel 26, 25, so David went on his way. He had left Saul to go on his way and go back home. And David is disappearing now in chapter 27, puts into context where he is going. Preceding this leaving, though, David had announced to Saul 
that he recognized the intention of his enemies. There were those who were speaking to Saul in his mind, in his heart, and, and saying to Saul, you know, you need to watch out for this David, he's trouble. I know you've given up hunting him once, but, but it wouldn't hurt to go again. And what we really want to do is try and drive him out of Israel and drive him away from God. Look at verse 19 of chapter 26. Now therefore, please let my lord the king, Saul, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. They want him out of the land. They want him away from God. And David knows this. And that is his comfort until. It's not a word on the passage, but it's a word in the context. Until. David decides to flee beyond the reach of Saul. He wants to get right away from it. Who can blame him? It's been years. He's been going from pillar to post. Every time he has tried to settle, someone has let on where he is. Somebody has been stirring things up, and Saul has come out with his thousands of men, and he has had to hide. He has had his own family in hiding in Moab. He can no longer see them on a regular basis like he did. The town where he lived is no longer home. Everything is upside down. He has responsibilities for all kinds of people. And he has had enough. He needs to get away. You know that we too can face intolerable circumstances at times in our life. It seems as if there is no more. I can't do this anymore in a cycle of something that reoccurs and we get fed up to the hind teeth of it. Not only this, we're concerned for its impact upon others. What is this doing to my family, to my loved ones? What is this doing? We don't need this anymore. And at such times, it can be a temptation. Let's run. The grass looks greener over there. Maybe it doesn't look greener. I don't think it did in David's occasion. It just was a case, at least I won't have to keep running from Saul. At least I won't have to keep facing that. Before we take such a course of action, we should look at the text and consider controlling our reactions to intolerable circumstances. They are intolerable circumstances that David faces. Which of us wants to go around living in secret, hiding away, with the responsibility of feeding people who can't come out in the open in case someone lets on, and knowing that any time Saul will come again and he will try again to kill? Yes, the Lord is my protection, but I can only be pushed so far. Well, let us think about this, controlling our reactions to intolerable circumstances. There are three of them. They're quite poetic. Well, at least they were in my mind. David closes his mind, David crosses the line, David caught in a bind. All right? David closes his mind. David said in his heart. David's confidence, you see, hasn't lasted, has it? I mean, this is the man who wrote a majority of the Psalms that we have. His, his confidence is in God. That great Psalm, one, one, uh, number 23, sorry. I was going through all the list of them. 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What a confidence that is. But David's confidence here is shaken. He recognizes true facts. Saul will be back. And sure enough, when we find that David has gone to Achish, Saul gives up, but he hasn't given up when he went back, it seems. He still had a mind to chase David down. He's had two near misses with death already. If David had not been the man of God he is, he would have been slaughtered by now. And the thought troubles him. It's in his mind. It's often a sharper place than a sword coming to the throat, isn't it? It's the place where the enemy really likes to get at us in our thinking. And David is thinking over this. And he began to think in his own words that he would be swept away. Interesting choice of words, that. 
For in the previous chapter, he had spoken of Saul to his servant when they'd gone into the camp of Saul and said, one day the Lord may sweep him away in battle. He may sweep him away. And now he speaks of himself. God will sweep Saul away, but one day Saul may sweep me away. And he puts this power in his mind. He thinks of Saul as a powerful man. And he knows that not to be true in the context of God. But David thought in his heart. What does that tell us? He is leaving God out of his thinking. Look at verse 10 of chapter 26. Uh, David, furthermore, as the Lord lives, he shall strike him. On that day he shall die, and he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord will do all this. But David is leaving it out of his thinking now. Saul has somehow got this power to come and take his life when he chooses. He'll not give up. Eventually the odds will stack against me. God will lose, and I will be lost. And he does not mention God. He is the absent name in this chapter. It's not like the book of Esther where he's the absent name in the whole of the book. But it's just a chapter of David's life where God is not mentioned. doesn't mean he's absent. It just means he is absent from David's thinking at this time. Let me give you an illustration from history. It was in 1854. None of you remember it. But Charles Spurgeon, famous preacher from London, he wouldn't like that phrase, famous, but he is to us. He was a preacher in London. In the first year's, year of his ministry in London, a cholera struck in London. We don't realize how blessed we are to live in the age we do and in the place we do. One family after another called Spurgeon to the bedside of loved ones, and he almost stood daily at a grave. As this young man Spurgeon threw himself into visitation of the sick with all his youthful vigor. Soon, however, he became weary in body and sick in heart. He began to think about he, that he was about to succumb. I'm visiting all these people. They're dying. I'm standing by their graves. I am so close to all of this. I am sure I will soon die. He was on the great Dover Road in London, dragging himself home from another funeral when a large broadside, says the writer here, posted in a, shoe, uh, broadside, posted in a shoemaker's window arrested his attention. It did not look like a trade announcement, nor was it. In the center of a large sheet of paper, in good, bold handwriting, stood these words. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall, be, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He says the words from Psalm 91, 9 and 10 took immediate effect. Spurgeon reported faith appropriated the passage as my own. I felt secure, refreshed. I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. Interesting, the words of the psalm were a comfort to this man Spurgeon. But in the midst of his trouble here, these words aren't getting through to David. Think of the times he speaks of the Lord being his refuge. We, we look to the previous occasion where he went to the land of the Philistines and, and the word of God seems to be inspired by such occasions as he wrote in the Psalms. But it isn't happening here. Why? Because God is not allowed into the thinking here. I will be swept away. I will be ruined. It's all going to be gone. And this is where David struggles. He has closed his mind. It reminds us we need to keep our minds open to God, don't we? And my dear friends, that's not easy. Sometimes we need a situation, and thank God for them, like Spurgeon, where some, not wise or clever or intelligent according to these world's ideas, but somebody who just brings the word of God to us in a moment, and it just draws us back and says, ah, the Lord's in control. The 
Lord is my refuge, my shelter. When we close our mind, we're tempted to run. God is not able to handle this. I want to have sufficient grace to cover this. It will not be enough. Eventually, this will all be over. If I leave myself to the thinking according to this world, all those things could be true. But when I bring God into the equation, well, the psalmist says, even one man should be able to chase a thousand. And there will be no one who can stand against the Lord's anointed. The Lord is able, but if I close my mind to God, I will be tempted to run. I wonder, does that sum up someone here this evening? You feel that? You think, yes, that's me. I, I want to get out of this situation. And I can see the danger I'm in, and I want out, and I want to run. Well, ask yourself the question, have I closed my mind to God? Is this how you were thinking a little while back about a same situation? When you saw the Lord was in control, he could take control of this. He could remove that person. He could change that circumstance. Let him come back into the situation. Don't close your mind to God. For when you close your mind to God, something else happens. David crosses the line. Decides in his mind this is a good idea. He moves himself and all who took refuge with him. It's a big responsibility. We shouldn't overlook it. David wasn't just thinking of himself in this. He was thinking of these other people. He surely must have been. 600 men and their households. Uh, there is two wives of his own to worry about. He has all these other men who've got their families, their households, their children, and livestock, probably all of this to be accounted for. And it's hard to hide them, isn't it? You've played hide and seek. It's not too bad hiding one person. Try hiding 600. You can't do it very easily. And the pressure of this would certainly tell upon the man. But look at David's action. He goes again to Achish. There is a symmetry to this section of the book. Between Saul's, uh, David's fleeing from Saul on the first occasions and then running to the place to hide in the cave of Adullam, and then he goes to the land of the Philistines, and where does he go? He goes to Achish, the king of Gath. And then Saul makes a first attempt on David's life, and then there is a second attempt on David's life, and now David goes back again where he went in the first place, to Achish. But last time he went, he pretended to be mad. He heard what the people said, and they were saying, is this not David who... They sing of him that he has killed his tens of thousands. This is a mighty man. You want to be worried about him, king? David heard this and he pretended to be mad. He let his spittle run down his beard and he played the fool. But he doesn't play the fool this time. But one wonders if the man is a little out of his mind. Would you go back to that place again? But he is looking for a place where Saul will not come. He's looking for somewhere where Saul will not chase him, and it seems to be the right place. For as soon as he has arrived and Saul hears that he is there and he is settled there, Saul gives up the chase. This is because Saul, David has given the impression to Achish that he is defecting. He is not simply running to Achish now to hide, but Achish says in the latter part of the chapter, when you came and you defected, you pledged your allegiance to me instead of to Saul. You pledged your allegiance to the Philistines instead of to Israel. You defected when you defected. And he seems to have been clear in what he was doing and what he was saying. And David then goes on to earn the favor of this king. One thing to tell him the words, but you need to prove it in action. In verse 6 of chapter 27, it says this, So Achish gave him Ziglag that day, Therefore Ziglag belonged to the kings of Judah. He had a place to dwell. He earned a home to be in. But how he earned that favor is told us in verse 11, the manner of the way in which he went against every town. He would neither save man nor woman alive to bring news to Garth, lest they should inform on us, saying that thus David did. And such was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. There's a few lines David's crossed there, isn't there? He's crossed the boundary. 
going into the land of the Philistines. He has certainly crossed the line of integrity. He's lying through his teeth. He's lying about why he is there. He's lying about what he is doing there. He is certainly not touching the land of Judah. He is doing anything but. He is killing other people in other places. Israel's enemies of old. But nevertheless, he's not doing what he said. He is doing complete pretense. This does not sound like a godly man, does it? It does not. This is the man who has crossed the line. He has cut God out of his thinking and the thought that brought him to the place. It seems to be a good idea how many times our sins seem to be a good idea. Look, it's worked out well. Saul's not chasing me. But he is now crossing lines he would never have done in his integrity. And he is beholding to a man that he would never have considered himself to be beholding too when he was trusting in the Lord. Do you recognize the dangers then of crossing the line? You change your behavior. He did it the first time. He pretended to be mad. This time he is mad. He, he pretends that he is honoring the king. All the time he is simply a murderer earning his keep. Uh, you note this is the pattern of his life while he's in the land of the Philistines. It wasn't the pattern of his life when he was in Israel. He didn't behave like this in murdering every man and every woman in a place, whatever religious grounds he could have given for the backing of that. It wasn't his pattern when he was in Israel. It wasn't the way he behaved with his enemies at other times. He crossed an awful lot of moral boundaries. He was prepared to lie, not little lies, big lies. And it also seemingly has impacted his religion. You see, the Philistines do not worship the living God. In fact, they worship anything but the living God. They have that temple of their God, which God had already struck down in their uh, cities, and they worship this God, this idol. And every battle that David won would have been attributed to that God. Every bit of tribute he brought was attributed to that God. It jeopardized his religion. My dear friends, isn't that not the same with us? We close the mind to what God is able to keep us from, protect us in, strengthen us, and do and work his purpose, and we decide to run. And when we decide to run, it often leads us to these two great dangers. It, je it weakens our walk with God and it corrupts our morals. It corrupts our morals. We want to get out of a work situation where it's hard to be a Christian. Sometimes we cross the line and we think, well, we'll just let a little bit go. We didn't decide to change the job or the circumstance. We just changed our behavior a little. It wasn't much. My friends, what a difference it made to the clarity of our testimony. And we found before long, once you've crossed the line a little bit, how quickly you have to cross the line again. It's the thing with lies, isn't it? You begin to tell one, you have to tell another one to cover it, and so it goes on. Corrupting religion, corrupting lies. Be careful when you think about running under extreme circumstances. So David has closed his mind, he has crossed the line, but here is the third. David caught in a bind. That's why we read those opening verses of the next chapter, which are definitely connected to the context. Uh, David is in this, under the rule of this man, Achish. He is the king of this area of Gath, and there he is, and he has earned his reputation only in 12, was it a year and four months. It's only a short time but David's got a good reputation. Achish trusts him intently. And he says to David, you know exactly what's going to happen now, don't you? The Philistines and Israel are gathered together in war, and you are expected to go with me into battle. At this point, you might think, or David thinks, where I will get out of this somehow. I'm sick today, and I don't think my men are really up to the task. But he doesn't say anything of the sort. Of course he wouldn't. He's dug himself such a hole. Surely you know what your servant can do, he says. He offers his service and that of his servant, 
And Achish takes this as a pledge of his allegiance in such a way that he says that he will make David one of his chief guardians forever. This is like making him one of those American secret service men who's going to guard the president and be close to him, or one of our own secret servicemen who go around with the prime minister or whatever. I'm going to trust you to be right next to me and near to me, one of my chief guardians. This is the way in which David has totally put himself in Achish's place. Achish then has this opportunity now to trust him, and he does. David hasn't changed his story. Now how will David get out of this mess? Well, the answer is in the next chapter, but we're not going to get there. But we can see in the passage here, there's not a new pattern. James tells us in James 1.14, this is the way it happens with sin always. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. When I started to think in the land of Israel, Saul's going to come and he's going to sweep me away. I was being drawn away by my own desires. I wanted to spare my own life and get myself out of that circumstance. When that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Across the line, I begin to lie. I corrupt my religion or wherever else the sin works out. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. If David goes into war this day, his relationship with the Israelites is over. He will never be able to look them in the face again. He will certainly never ever be king of them. There is no way. It, it, sin has taken hold of his life. And all for the little bit of thinking in his mind, one day Saul will sweep me away. It has enticed him, drawn him aside, along with all the people with him, and it will bring forth death. Dear friend, you see, you were being pushed. You were being told that that circumstance was going to work out in this way and one day it's all going to come to an end and you're going to be ruined. And you let your mind get thinking in that way, I need this thing, I need that to happen, I need to get myself out of that circumstance. And the desire was conceived and it conceived in such a way as to produce sin. And the writer of the Proverbs says this, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. And it's exactly what sin does with us. It digs us into a hole. And it becomes so deep that it's like digging our own grave. And eventually the sides collapse in and come over us. Ah, but what for one thing? Dear friends, beware of the trap. Running. The man who closes his mind to God will soon cross the line and soon be caught in a bind. But let me give you the conclusion, because that would leave you in a depressing place. Have you noticed it was a measured time? Now the time that David was dwelt in the country of, the, of Philistines was one full year and four months. My dear friends, sometimes we ought to praise God it's only one full year and four months. David had been on the run, it would be, the time he'd finished with Saul, it would be ten years. And for one year and four months out of that time, David spent it in the land of the Philistines. But while it was a long time in David's mind, because we know that, because he kept count. He didn't keep count of the other bits, but he did this. It was all, it, so did God keep count. So did God. The record of God's word is based upon David's experience, but it's written in God's word because God has had it written there. You know, when we go for experiences like this, and we are not perfect, we may hear many sermons and look over passages like this and think, yeah, I've got that, yeah, don't close my mind to God. Well, I'll be sure not to do that. Yeah, it's easier read than done, isn't it? I'll not cross the line. Yeah, we cross the line many times. We find ourselves in a situation. Thank the Lord he measures the time. He will work out his purpose even when we seemingly go against it. Praise God for it. Our salvation is not in a God of our thinking. It's in the God of glory, the God of heaven. He is in control. 
doesn't excuse our mistakes. David allowed this to be known of him. It was known in his history. Thank God God's in control of it. We'll find in the next chapter later on, David is spared. He doesn't ever face the Israelites in battle. David learned important lessons stuck with him in other circumstances of his life. Wouldn't be his last mistake, but neither will it be ours. Thank God it's not permanent. It's a measured time. Beware of the dangers, crossing the mind, crossing the line, caught in a bind. Praise God, though, it's the time that is measured by God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for in our testimonies, those of us who have, Lord, we've not only read a passage like this, but we have lived it. Lord, we have closed our mind and let circumstances drive us. We have found ourselves to cross a line and then to be caught in that bind. Thank you, Lord, that you measured the time. Lord, you did not let it last one moment longer. Lord, you determined. And that when, Lord, you brought it to an end, you brought it back, us back to yourself. You brought us into the liberty again of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that your ways are higher than our ways. Lord, they are able to cope with our weaknesses, our failings, in order to bring about your glory. Lord, as we view and we give thank you to you for the measured time, we also ask, Lord, that you will help us not to close our mind to you. You know, Lord, how easy and how, uh, how difficult it can be for us as human beings to meditate on your word, to pray, and, Lord, to include you in our everyday living and the things that we do. Particularly, Lord, when we are under stress, facing difficult circumstances that don't seem to appear to us in those moments in the Bible. Pray, Lord, in these times that you will keep us open to you. Make us studiers of your word. Lord, even if we don't know how to dig deeply, may we learn to read that when the time comes by your Holy Spirit, we will hear the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the Psalms at such times. Even that one that's most memorable. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thank you, Lord, that in that Psalm we're reminded we should fear no evil. For you are with us. Lord, you will protect us. So may we feel and know that protection in this coming week. But Lord, as we come around your table this evening in a few moments, may this most of all be our our encouragement. But Lord, here we taste and see the Lord is good as we know our forgiveness and we know our Redeemer in the Lord Jesus Christ.